Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Clayton Cheever. I am the assistant director at the Thomas Crane Public Library in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening uh, for our program that we are co-sponsoring with the Quincy Climate Action Network. Uh, we've done many pro such programs with QCAN before. Um, hopefully, I'm getting some weird feedback on mine, so hopefully my video on all your screens isn't poor. We did some testing ahead of time and Zig was very clear. Um, so you don't have to put up with me for very long. So if you're having a suboptimal experience, please hang with us. And uh, as soon as I pass the spotlight on uh, to David and to, to Zig, uh, I, I promise everything will be good and I'll be in the background providing tech support. Um, we are a couple of just uh, administrative pieces here. We are using the chat network, uh, the, the chat channel, both here in Zoom and on Facebook and YouTube uh, to facilitate communication. Uh, this is so that we don't have extemporaneous roommates or friends in the background who don't know uh, that we're participating in this meeting together. Uh, and they, you know, we, we don't have any aud you know, audible trespassing in our group. Um, here uh, inadvertent or people are trying to be disruptive. We wanna make this as good an experience as possible. Um, and it's also so we can have this available to everybody, hopefully where you want to be, whether it's here on Zoom with us, whether you're joining us by YouTube or Facebook. Um, if you have other platforms that you'd like us to explore, please let me know. Um, I'm always happy to, to explore and see what I can sustain to make it so the library can be with you. Uh, we were just talking about the wonders of the virtual library. Uh, sometimes I put a virtual background behind me. I have been in the library earlier this week. I'm sure I'll be in the library again, but we're not welcoming the public yet into the library while we are doing these public programs and have been doing these actually for quite some time um, online. So hopefully this brings more resources to you and makes it as easy as possible for you to join us. Um, we are doing some other exciting library programs right now. We have to-go services that have been launched. Um, if you would like to request things from around the state, uh, you can do that in our catalog or you can contact us and we can help you find uh, books, movies, music, um, musical scores. There's all sorts of things we have available that we can hold for you. Once the hold comes in, you'll get a notification by email or text, and then you can set up an appointment to come during a 15 minute window. We only allow five people every 15 minutes to keep you safe um, and keep everybody safe. Uh, and then you can come and pick up your items. So it's, it's super smooth. We've had lots of people taking advantage of it. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to do so. If you're looking to get your hands on a new book because you've gone through everything in your house or you're just tired of looking at the ones in your house. Um, I know we probably all have way longer aspirational lists than we could imagine. Um, there's a lot of great programs that are happening here online. I encourage you to check out our calendar. We have another program happening actually just tomorrow night on Zoom. It's a different Zoom address, but you can catch us on the same channels on YouTube and Facebook. Um, tomorrow night, we're meeting with Professor Delvin Case, uh, who's doing a four-part series every Wednesday this month, all on the history of popular music styles. And tomorrow night, we're gonna be talking about party music. Uh, you can catch on Facebook a recording of last week's um, sometimes we run into some copyright issues with those, um, but I think that is still up actually on Facebook. Um, obviously, we're using, you know, very popular music to talk about this history program, which is all within copyright issues to do, but the robots on YouTube do not care. They do not have any respect for the educational nature of these programs, and we get taken down there. So we're, we're working with QATV, and we'll be hosting this program as well in the future. So... I could talk on and on, but that's not why you're here. I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna pass the baton to David Reich with the Quincy Climate Action Network, uh, who will say a few words uh, further before we get started with Zig. David, take it away. Wonderful, thank you, Clayton. Thanks to the Thomas Crane uh, Library for uh, um, partnering with uh, QCAN. Uh, as you said, it's been, uh, it's been about eight years and we've co-sponsored uh, probably a couple of thousand events uh, together, lectures uh, by experts from places like the Sierra Club and the Union of Concerned Scientists and from Harvard and BU and films about climate change and how to respond to climate change. And uh, we're, uh, this is our first uh, virtual lecture, uh, but it won't be our last, we actually are uh, firming up the details of the uh, lecture uh, uh, that's scheduled for the uh, 15th of September with the uh, recently retired uh, chief uh, architectural engineer of the National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the QCAN website will, will have info on that. Uh, 
uh, as we approach the date. Um, Toucan's uh, not just an educational group, though. We also do advocacy, and uh, and uh, there's uh, I, I could cite a long list of the positive changes we've helped bring to Quincy, but uh, uh, I think we're largely among uh, friends here. Uh, for anyone who'd like uh, more detail about that, have a uh, have a look at our website www.quincycan.org. Um, the about QCAN tab on our uh, homepage uh, will take you to a sampling of some of the stuff we've accomplished. Uh, for now, I'll just say that we've helped make uh, the city more energy efficient and help bring bring in a lot of uh, clean renewable energy um, process that's ongoing as the city works to form a green electricity aggregation. Uh, um, other stuff we're working on currently, we're pushing uh, on the cities to start using electric fleet vehicles. And uh, there may be some good news on that forthcoming in the next while. Um, to, uh, we're trying to make sure that new buildings constructed in Quincy and especially buildings uh, constructed by the city adhere to the most rigorous efficiency standards. And uh, uh, we're, we're working to get the MBTA to replace the old style diesel buses that are uh, um, befouling our air here in the city uh, with um, zero emission electric buses. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a fight that I think will be going on for a year or two, but uh, we've, we've launched into it already with help from the uh, Green Energy Consumers Alliance. If you'd like to uh, be part of this exciting movement, uh, we welcome new members. Meetings are open to everyone. Um, we've been meeting online via Zoom and uh, you can, uh, 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 we, we actually, we meet on the second Wednesday of the, um, month, uh, which for this month means tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. And if you'd like to attend that meeting or any future meeting, you can uh, send an email to info at quincycan.org, info at quincycan.org, and we'll send you a link that will allow you to get into the meeting. So enough of that. Now to the business at hand. Our lecturer this evening, uh, Professor Sigmund Platter of uh, Boston College Law School is a genuine hero of the environmental movement. Among his claims to fame, he served as chief plaintiff's counsel in the landmark endangered species case, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority versus Hill. Not only did Zig help save a species that was slated for certain extinction, but a Supreme Court decision in the case established that the Endangered Species Act means exactly what it says, that it allows no exceptions. Uh, his book about that case, The Snail Daughter and the Dam, was published by Yale University Press. Sig has also had a hand in many other famous cases. He consulted for the plaintiffs in the Woburn toxic waste litigation that became the subject of the book and movie, A Civil Action. Uh, consulted for the plaintiffs in the beef order Arise an oil spill, which he mentioned uh, a few minutes ago as we were chatting. And as you're going to find out soon, he chaired the Alaska State Commission that investigated the Exxon Valdez disaster and learned some useful truths about our politics that also apply to today's fight against climate change. As if all those accomplishments were not enough, Zig is also lead author of Environmental Law and Policy, a textbook now in its fifth edition. And he's published in 40 plus law reviews. He has a BA from Princeton, a JD from Yale. He's won numerous awards. And as you're going to find out, he's a hell of an entertaining speaker. Uh, Zig? I hope I can live up to that. Greetings, everyone. Um, so I was having a conversation with David about the calamities that all of us are living with. I mean, every day we're thinking of COVID-19 and behind it, climate. And these both 
Oops, the recording is stopped, Clay. And, and so we were talking about these calamities, COVID-19 and, and climate and how the whole world is trying to figure out how to handle puzzles that, that had never before been so big. And I said something about how, well, you got to learn from disasters. You can't learn from professors. Um, and, and David said, well, what do you mean? And I, I was the chair of the legal task force for the state of Alaska Oil Spill Commission. And disasters in the past sometimes are easier to look at. You've had more time to digest them and they're a little bit less uh, controversial. And so David said, well, why, why, why don't you bring that to Quincy, which is a town that has a city that has a bunch of people who are interested and care and are smart. And so, you know, most journalists that I've worked with are not half as smart as David. And so I took him seriously. I said, okay, let, let's do it. And so that is what we're going to do this evening. Uh, Clayton, shall we just start or what should we do? I think we're good to jump right in. I'm just letting everybody know that if they have any questions, they can ask them in the chat streams and I'll just plot that in there. And if you have any links or anything that you'd like people to follow, um, I did put a link for Quincy Can into the chat stream uh, on all three channels. So if there's anything else you'd like me to share, Zig, please let me know. Now, can you see that first slide? We can, you're looking good. Marvelous, okay. So, so, so um, I, I felt favored to be able to be pulled into the Exxon Valdez case, uh, but it was miserable as well. Uh, and so it turns out that my students were an amazing help to the commission. Um, here are some of them. Uh, I went uh, and said to my students, uh, the commission doesn't have a lot of money. We need free labor. I need at least five people, no credit, no money. Uh, and I got 17 people who prepared a bunch of reports. Uh, and, and my chair for the commission said, what are you feeding those kids in Boston? We got more input uh, for the Exxon Valdez oil spill from Boston College than we got uh, from any non-governmental organization in the US. Anyway, so, so do you see where we are? Oh, by the way, whoops, no, I, um, I'm trying. Can you see this arrow, Clayton? I'm using a, a yes, we can see arrow. you. Yep, we can see your error. Yep, all right, you're good. So, so, this is the Alaska oil system. It's a mega system, uh, probably in terms of, of direct mileage, one of the greatest. This is the North Slope, Prudhoe Bay uh, on the Arctic uh, Oceans. And this is the pipeline, which has been built. You're looking at 800 miles over two mountain ranges, and by the way, a bunch of uh, earthquake seismic uh, zones coming down over the last range of mountains to the town of Valdez. Um, and, and that's where there is a tank farm to the, the, the oil is, is stored for a day or two or more, and then loaded into ships that go, uh, as you can imagine, a long way down the coast, sometimes to Cherry Point in Washington, but almost all of them to Long Beach, uh, which is one of the reasons why Long Beach with the refineries has some of the worst hotspots uh, for air pollution in the United States. So, so the, the fact is you've got these, oh damn it, I didn't mean to give away the, <laughs> but you know the next slide uh, as has the, um, the splat, well, let's go right there. This is the Exxon Valdez oil spill schematically. Um, the Gulf, uh, Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska got hit terribly by a malfunction in the system you're looking at. Um, and this particular problem was a single hauled tanker that hit a rock. Um, but let's, I'm thinking now how, oh damn. Um, okay, so, so here, here's how it looks. Do you, do you see the red line? That's the pipeline coming down over the last range of mountains. And do you see on the shore there, that's the loading area. And I have a schematic boat there. It's like a fjord. It's very deep. And so the ship can be very close to shore. And it loads up 
uh, with oil. Now, I've got to tell you, the, the problems of this disaster are many, and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of them. It turns out, all right, we've got a single hulled tanker longer than three football fields. It's divided into 11 different compartments from the front to the back. And it turns out that it was being loaded by its crew at that time. Why do you have to have careful loading? Well, previously, there had been professional 24 seven crews because if you fill a single hull tanker too much in just the middle, it sinks and the boat cracks. Or if you fill the bow and the stern, they uh, uh, sink and the middle comes up. So, so it requires extraordinary expertise. But Alyeska, which was not a corporation, the partnership of seven different oil companies, including Exxon and BP, dominated by BP, 51%, said, we can save $4 million a year by laying off the expert loaders and having the ship's sea persons themselves load their ship. And they'll be careful because they don't want to die. Uh, and so that's what they were doing. But here's the other thing. To save money, Exxon and every other company had been cutting back, cutting back, not just on the loading crews, but on the crews for the ships. All right, the Exxon Valdez that we'll see in a, a bit was designed, do you know how many seamen? 36. And some accountant decided, well, if we lay one person off, we save two and a half million bucks a year for shore support and all kinds of things. So they laid a person off. And then the next one, after the first one got promoted, also said, let's lay in. The Exxon Valdez was sailing with only 16 people and they were supposed to be asleep getting ready for the trip back to LA, but they had to load the ship. In any event, that ship got loaded and around a little after nine o'clock in the evening of, of March uh, 23rd, it started moving down through the Valdez cut. Uh, the, the pilot got off right where the ship is there and proceeded further. But as you can see, that's the Columbia Glacier up on the upper left. It's been calving and there were glacier blocks out in the middle of uh, the, the channel. So the captain said, uh, let's shift a little bit to the right. And so they did, uh, and the ship proceeded uh, in that way. The trouble was there was only one person on the deck at that time because the captain had to go down to his cabin, why? To do the financial records of the turnaround, why? Because the bursar had been fired to save money. Are you getting an idea here? Okay, and so, out they go, and the radar doesn't tell them that they're a little bit too far to the right. The guy who is steering hasn't slept for 18 hours, and he has the ship on autopilot. His relief comes up, and she looks out, and she says, oh my god, this is Bly Reef. Look at the light. It's supposed to be way over to our left our port, and it's, it's over to our right. So they tried to turn, they tried to spin it, uh, and they called the captain who was coming up the stairs when this happened. It hit, uh, I've flown over and looked down, there are spines of granite coming up from very deep and they just ripped a single hull. Um, the single hull was not a double, because the head of Exxon shipping had been the Coast Guard commandant and he convinced Jimmy Carter that you didn't need double hulls. The radar, which should have warned them about the fact that they were off, had been cut back to a cheaper system because the industry didn't want to pay for it and the Coast Guard went along. And the ship is there rocking and ripping and the captain looks over 
and picks up the mic and says, Valdez, we've um, run aground a little and uh, we're losing a little oil. And that turned out, by the way, to be the public disclosure that prevented criminal liability uh, for, for the corporation. But the problem was it couldn't get off. Actually, they tried to get it off, which would have made it worse. But the first of 13 million gallons uh, uh, of oil started uh, falling out. All right, you can see Bly Reef here. And this is Hinchinbrook Island. It would have had rapid response, except Alieska persuaded the federal government that they didn't need a rapid response because they could always get stuff from here, from Valdez and get it out fast. Oops, um, hold on. Um, and, and so I want you to see also this. So you're, you're getting an idea of why this happened. Uh, this is the channel, the official channel, but the corporation persuaded the Coast Guard to make it voluntary, not mandatory. And so, as you can imagine, ships sometimes followed the channel and sometimes didn't. Um, it, it, it was an accident waiting to happen. Uh, here is Cordova and the fishermen there had been warning the local government and the state government of Valdez is up here that this was an accident waiting to happen. The pipeline leaked. The tanks were uh, substandard. There was no pollution control. They worried about the loading crew. They worried about the fact that the crews were sailing with, more, with half of what they were designed for and were sound asleep uh, at the wheel sometimes. The fishermen knew this. Uh, in fact, that evening, one of the fishermen, R Ricky Ott from Cordoba, uh, was talking to the Valdez Chamber of Commerce and said, look, gentlemen, we fishermen know the question isn't if a big one comes, it's only when. And it was two hours after she said that, that the Exxon Valdez hit Bly Reef. Uh, in any event, uh, the disaster uh, didn't have to be terrible. For the first 40 hours, there was no wind, which is very rare. And it turned out that nothing was done to boom it. And the fishermen finally went to the Valdez headquarters and Coast Guard uh, and, and, and Exxon and said, why aren't you booming it? And they said, well, the booms are covered with ice here in Valdez and the Betty B, the boat that's supposed to lay the, the boom is down in Seattle getting fixed. I don't know if I'm giving you too much detail, but you're getting the idea. They had one boat. The fishermen said, look at that mountain up there. The wind is starting to blow. It's too late to catch it all. We will lay the boom for you. And so the fishermen were the ones who got the boom and started laying, but far from here because the oil already was off and running. As you can see with the wind blowing from the Northeast, it went down more than a thousand miles of sea coast um, and wherever it touched, uh, it killed. Uh, and, and, and it could have been stopped right at the ship uh, if indeed the response system had been ready and, and the expertise was there. By the way, the government people and the Exxon people didn't know where to boom. So the fishermen who were, had been excluded initially from the headquarters went to the map and told the governments, state and federal, where they could have saving for some of the seal uh, pup, uh, for some of the best uh, fish spawning and so forth. Anyway, th this is the god awful mess. And, and something like 5% of the wildlife maybe was saved, but the vast majority uh, died. And here I am, do you see, I'm picking up rocks They'd sprayed this beach, the, the beaches in, in Alaska are rocks, uh, so that the vice president could walk and say that it was clean. And then he went away. If you lift up the rock and put on your hands, the oil was right underneath. Uh, over on the right, you can see that these guys spraying this stuff. Do you see a ventilator? Uh, no, you don't. Um, 
one of the guys came to me and said, look, um, this stuff that we're spraying, this dispersant, we are all peeing blood. So, so you can see not only are they only cleaning the, stop, the top, but they're doing it in a way that lets the television camera get a clean bunch of rocks, but it's poison. It's poison, to, and by the way, they said, but we don't tell the foreman because they'll send us back to Texas. They were making 30 bucks an hour uh, and they didn't want to lose that. In any event, the problem, as you can see, became humongous. And in this, this is sort of an ecological image. The oil hits a delicate ecosystem uh, and kills everywhere it touches. Um, so, so, as you know, the national media followed it closely and very quickly, everyone decided what caused this. It was a drunk captain. He had had three drinks in the afternoon before he went there at nine o'clock to sail out. And we were told on the commission that drunk, he was a better captain than uh, anybody uh, else in, in the trade, uh, although he was down in the cabin doing the financial records, right? And, and it turns out that as the commission went through, uh, by the way, this map was the way the commission was leveraged not just to talk about ships for sailing from Alaska down to LA, but it, we found out that there was leakage, both of gas and of oil in the tundra up there. The commission got lots of evidence about blowouts in the tundra, oh, damn it. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, uh, where the pipeline is, is crossing, some whistleblowers uh, tipped us off down in Valdez, this is the loading area and also the tank farm uh, and, and, and the offshore oil drilling uh, in some places too was leaking. This map was done by my students. They copied it from the Encyclopedia Britannica and then put their little charts on, but to say, it's not just the ships. It's a mega system. And the commission picked up on this and said, it's a mega system. And the bigger it is, it seems, the less the government is able to regulate it. This crash was the result of collusion, complacency, and neglect. And it turns out that the students uh, helped immensely writing the commission's report. And there were 59 recommendations this shouldn't ever happen again. Uh, nine or 10 of those were specific to Alaska and all the rest would prevent the kind of disaster happening uh, again. Uh, and, and, and so the report talks before the fact, the government, all the officials, corporate government and, and public government has got to be aware, has to do prevention planning, uh, do take actions preparing for response. And now you already know so much more than the American public about how there was very poor planning. The prevention actions and the response uh, were not ready for the worst case. They weren't even ready for a smaller case. But also the governance system has got to be planning for after the fact of a disaster, after you learn that COVID-19 is coming after you learn the facts uh, on, on global uh, greenhouse gas climate change. And after the fact, you have to jump into action with rapid accessing of information. Do you see why this is relevant uh, 30 years later? Rapid appropriate response actions, and then monitoring and adaptations as necessary, systemic changes. Um, chair of my commission said, do you know what John Kennedy said government has to be like? It has to be like basketball, not like football. Because in football, they just line up, they know what they're gonna do, bang. In basketball, you have to keep watching and adjust to what's going on and have an agenda that is flexible. Uh, and he said, we need government like that as well. Um, unfortunately, um, this chart, 
is great in seminar, where you see you conceptualize the problem, you plan actions before, and you monitor when it is coming upon you, then you implement the monitoring, you adapt, you analyze, you change your system. We're in the middle of systemic changes, praise God. And then you share that learning feedback loop back into the governance planning, right? This is adaptive resiliency. And this is what our commission said has to be part of the governance. But do you see 20 years later, the spill report for Exxon Valdez had not been acted upon. And 20 years before Exxon Valdez, the Santa Barbara spill had given us lessons that weren't acted upon. And here we are in the middle of another calamity. Uh, these are my students. I said, I need 10 and I got 37. Uh, and those white papers were sent to the President's Commission on the Deepwater Horizon. <laughs> and and uh, the, the executive director called me immediately and said, these students have opened doors that politically we were not able to address, including the fact that dispersants should not be used, that should be skimmers. Uh, but the industry said by saving money, we just spray and that's all you need. Why does this happen? Well, why do these things happen when they're foreseeable? And once they happen, why is the government often so inept? When I went to Washington, I was working a little bit on Alaska lands, but mostly on endangered species. They said to me, look, all of government is an iron triangle. I'd never heard of that. What do you mean? A, a triangle is a rigid, very strong geometric figure. And you have the industry, you have the agency that's supposed to regulate the industry, but it also often subsidizes the industry. And you have the congressional clique that's part of the triangle because of campaign finance from, from the industry. And it turns out they said, there's not just a waterway uh, or shipping there. And this is only like a 10th of, of the triangles that dominate the Washington I had to work in. Timber, railroads, mining, oil and gas. Of course, uh, fossil fuels is probably the biggest now that the NRA <laughs> is, is under uh, siege. Highways, pesticides, big pharma, big banking, home builders. I mean, you think about it. Uh, these day by day are involved with everything going on, whereas the media can over only cover four, five, six issues. Um, and, and this is at the state level uh, as well. So, so this is the same triangle uh, in the Gulf. The mineral mining service was literally not just uh, complacency, collusion, and neglect, but, but drugs and sex with the industry. Uh, I can tell you more off uh, line. Uh, and up in Washington, Dick Cheney, was and, and you know almost president of the United States and dominated uh, the planning uh, for fossil fuel. It, it, it is a system that's rigid and non-adaptive and not ready. Uh, oh, and by the way, just to give you a sense of the Iron Triangle, when I did my endangered species work, uh, funded by T-shirts and my Visa card, these were the people lined up against the Endangered Species Act because it allowed citizens to raise substantial questions about projects and programs. Look, do, do you see the power? The wonder is that environmentalists ever win anything and it's only when the facts are overwhelming. Um, all right, here's something else I want to, to share with you. Subsidiarity. It's not talked about much in, in the United States, uh, but when I taught in Africa, they talked about subsidiarity. It's a, it's a canon law. What does it mean? Decisions should be made at the lowest level at which they can be rationally and competently made. And sometimes that's the United Nations. But often it's down on the ground. The local government or remember the fishermen were the ones who knew this was coming, knew what had to be done. Uh, subsidiarity is a very interesting doctrine. And it's the kind of thing that I tell my students is really quite important if you want to understand how governance should work. 
because in any project or program, there are several different layers which should be consulted for different things. So now if you look, there, the layers of government uh, by the lower left, the IMO, the International Maritime uh, Association organization is completely dominated by the industry. Uh, the International Arctic Council actually is stronger. My chairman uh, of the oil spill committee is on the Arctic Council. The Alaska state government, 90% of its revenues at this time were coming from oil. There are tribes, the municipalities, Valdez was desperately worried, but uh, was not uh, listened to. And the fishermen, as you saw, they were the ones who knew what was coming. And when it came, they were the ones who knew what to do. Uh, this very, and, and, and the federal government uh, was dominated again by a Coast Guard that had said, oh no, we just need single hulls. Uh, so the politics of it is different from the rationality of it. Subsidiarity, I mean, for instance, in air pollution and water pollution, the federal government has to set a national standard, but it's far better for the states and municipalities to be the ones that actually broker that standard into reality. Um, well, it turns out the answer to bad subsidiarity um, is people. And so as part of what we did, this is quite unusual. I, I, if any of you has a student wanting to look for a term paper, the Regional Citizens Advisory Council was set up in the settlement we reached with Exxon and it subsequently went in um, to the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, that citizens will sit with the power of oversight officially within the governance with the ability to go to the federal government, to the state government, to the local government and say, this is the truth and you're ignoring it. Um, it, it it's a kind of pluralism that is quite uh, uh, unprecedented, uh, but it, look what it does. This is coming kind of political science. Uh, for years and years and years, it was a dipolar system of government. The market was what guaranteed, you know, we would have wealth and quality of life and food uh, and homelessness. But uh, the, the fact though, that the private marketplace had external costs that were like pollution, like child labor, that government has to come in and, and resolve the legislature and agencies. It's dipolar. The trouble is power attracts. And very often, if you are working in Congress or in an agency and you have a problem coming from the fossil fuel industry, do you see, it's best to be reasonable because as soon as you've got your 20 years, you're gonna to wanna to retire into a more powerful job with more money and it's in the industry you know best. Agency capture uh, is part of the problem. And part of the answer is this, starting in 1960, uh, environmentalists, well, actually first, Martin Luther King, then Ralph Nader, and then environmentalists came in 20 of the bills that were passed into law by the greatest environmental president in our history. Who was that? Richard Nixon was told that environment was the big thing. And so he said, I'm gonna be the environment. Anyway, each of those statutes, we put in a provision saying citizens can enforce the law if the government doesn't. The Iron Triangle can be directly sued from outside the triangle. You don't have to wait for a government agency. So what you're looking at is still a battle because every one of the Bush and Trump appointments to the Supreme Court is against citizen suits, against pluralism. Uh, the dipolar system favors the establishment of the past. I would say that pluralism, multicentric, is what you need to adjust for the future. So you see, there's some political science philosophy for you. Um, okay, um, I may have, let's stop there for a moment. Uh, Clayton, look at the chats. Are there questions that we should address right now? We've not, we've had a couple of technical questions about making sure people's audio and such was working. Okay. Um, asking if there were gonna be a multiple part and I've just heard folks, nope, this is a one-time uh, okay. presentation. Well, so that's where we are uh, right now. 
how wonderful my presentation has been so far. Talking about causation from a rigid triangle, the subsidiarity and the idea of pluralism like basketball JFK. And there's one other thing that comes from this. And this is a, a principle that was produced by Marcel Puyer, uh, a professor in Limoges in France. And he said, look, it is so hard to get public value regulations, public protections into a government system that we have to have a jurisprudential principle that just in general, public protections will not be reversed by political pressure coming from the interests who are regulated. Uh, and this has been adopted. The Supreme Court of Brazil has adopted. It's in a number of international conventions. But as you can imagine, uh, non-regression is something that the, the iron triangles desperately reserve, resist. Um, Bill Douglas was in my class once in Tennessee and he said, as I told my old friend, Franklin Roosevelt, your agency should be shut down after five or 10 years because they're, they're no good. They're gonna be totally in bed by that time. All right, um, Clayton, are we ready to go to climate? Let's go to climate. David, do you have any questions so far? Oops, is David no. muted? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Uh, I, I do want to hear what you have to say about climate and, uh, and the iron triangles and uh, may have some questions after that. Yeah. Um, and I do the, think it's fair to say that uh, just to give people a preview, we're going to talk about climate and then we're going to end with, I don't know if it's an end, but we're also going to talk about the pandemic that we're currently experiencing and some lessons to apply to that. So a little teaser for things to come for folks. Okay, you're looking at the climate curve. It turns out that LBJ was told actually in 1964 by the Rand Corporation, there is something that is going to change the world to the negative unless we do something now that greenhouse gases are starting to change the temperature and that could melt the ice within the next hundred years, um, grossly uh, uh, overestimating the number of, of years. Uh, and look, LBJ thought that his environmental laws would make a difference and did nothing. Nixon had signed uh, 22 environmental laws into, and, and, and he did nothing because he was told quite quickly that his base uh, was uh, based in the marketplace and the marketplace was built on ignoring climate. Ford at first started listening to the scientists and then was told by the political people that he wouldn't get reelected uh, and that happened. And Carter came in, an engineer, and he was freaked out by this, but he also was told that he had no political power against this because the political iron triangles were against virtually every economic and scientific uh, agenda that he tried to bring in uh, to government. Reagan, as you can imagine, reversed a number of the things that Carter uh, uh, put in and, and was basically uh, a market-driven, triangle-driven presidency. Uh, he's a sweet guy, um, Bush, Papa Bush, four years, he was in the CIA. The CIA had been worried about climate change. Bush knew all about it, but he also knew that the fossil fuel industry was the only way he could get a second term uh, against the, the Democrats. Uh, he didn't, Clinton came in but Clinton turned out to be kind of a, eh, a Republican Democrat and, and did nothing for climate change. And look, it's growing. Bush too, at first Mr. Bush was talking about greenhouse gases and then Cheney took over, if you've seen the movie W, 
And basically it was a Cheney administration uh, and the policy was set that uh, fossil fuels were not to be regulated. Fracking could not be regulated at all under any statute. Um, Obama came in and had a marvelous agenda in many ways, but, but in climate. And then uh, it turned out that it was blocked for two years by the Iron Triangle. And then the Senate went Democrat, uh, went Republican and Obama collapsed. He said, all right, we're gonna to try to get uh, all of the above. And Trump, of course, is the one who said, you shall not talk about climate change. And we, we are now, has everybody had a nice summer or a hot, humid summer? I mean, you're looking at it. This is a tragedy. And it's a tragedy for my grandchildren or great grandchildren because to reverse this takes at least two generations if we start reversing it. Um, and, and you know, it's a disaster. I, I think, uh, by the way, this book over here, Losing Earth, A Recent History by Nathaniel Rich is really quite amazing. And it, it turns out that in 2016, uh, Obama and, and the US government uh, was critically important in getting the Paris Agreement uh, to be uh, 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 ratified uh, by most countries, not by ours, but um, Obama signed it in a way I can talk about at some point. Um, and Obama started moving. The clean power plan that he had was an extraordinary way. Do you see how the way he was trying to slow down on coal, unless it was clean coal, and shift to renewables would increase employment in the US and decrease greenhouse gases, not as much as the scientists want. But this plan, the clean power plan was really quite extraordinary. Um, and it, it, we were hopeful. And coal started, the market started listening to Obama and saying, well, we don't need to go into coal so much, although China kept going. Um, but then, as you can see, the Trump administration, each of these is an initiative, you can see the Clean Power Plan, but all of these have been attacked, targeted, and some of them have been uh, uh, nullified, some of them have been uh, repeal, repealed. We are in regression, regression, regression. And the climate is not subject to electoral change. The climate is going to be there uh, and it has to be handled by people outside government as well as people inside government because this is the way the current administration, these are the regulations that were targeted for destruction in the first year. And that was an amazing accomplishment in the first year. If you look here, this is just the first year, environment wins. 58 environmental protections were uh, reversed, diluted, or at least attacked. Labor and finance, look, we're twice as good as everybody else in terms of deregulation. The number today is 95, and overall close to 300 health, safety, uh, civil rights, financial protection, immigration, obviously, um, regression, regression. We have a lot of work to do. And you can see that Michel Prieur is, is, is feeling terrible about the whole thing. Just in terms of oil, there were some rules that were put into the Gulf of Mexico by Obama after our reports on the Deepwater Horizon. The Trump eliminated half of the blowout preventers, cut back on inspections. They could be done by the companies themselves no third party inspections and real time monitoring stopped. Everything was going to be done uh, by telephone. Anyway, um, okay, where are we now? This is a different crisis. And I want you to note that some of the same problems 
iron triangles and so forth are clearly problematic, but government action is far more visible here. Why is that? Because analytically, which is the greater danger to us? Climate or COVID-19? Is COVID-19 gonna be there for my great grandchildren? I like this image. Do you see anything distinguishing between the countries most affected by the virus and the countries that have managed it best? I, I don't know what the difference might be, but they're nice pictures. You see my point. Um, it, it turns out that when women have come into government, they are more observant, more adaptive, they have to be to live with us, more resilient, and ultimately much more like basketball than us football guys. This is the tragedy that we are in, and it is a tragedy that the rest of the world, no one else has managed it as bad, even Brazil has managed it better than we have with the denialist uh, president. I mean, I don't feel ashamed with my students for being non-neutral on this. Look at Dr. Fauci. And so here is a, a, a graph. Now, I have my thumbnail over it. I've got to move it. Um, but do you see, this is us. And we dropped off a little bit, but, but this is just in, in the month of March. And, and we'll talk more about that. And this is Germany. Angela Merkel very quickly put together a body of scientists and said, you will dominate our national response. Merkel is a scientist. Our current president uh, is a scientist, uh, he says, a very good one. Uh, but, but it turns out that look at those other curves. Uh, we started, you know, eh, right at the beginning with the others and we didn't, uh, we didn't go to a plateau. Um, and, and here, if you look at the United States, we started going down. Why did we start going down? Because there was subsidiarity. You see what I'm saying? New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, a number of states said science is going to lead us. And if the federal government is not going to do anything to coordinate with no national plan, we'll do it ourselves. And they did the lockdown and, and they started dropping it down, down. And, and it turns out that some states started following, but then started opening up again. When the president said, look, we need to have the schools open. We need to have rallies. We need, all right, you, you understand. Look at the European Union. Angela Merkel is a very big part of it because Germany had more cases than any other country in the European Union, but fewer deaths per capita than anybody else in the European Union. Why? Science at the start. And she, she, went, she went for masks. She talked about lockdowns. She had a number of uh, limitations on density. You get the picture. Um, and it turns out that their curve is the curve we would prefer. Um, I think that's enough to start talking. Here I am flying in, oh, oh, this, this is Valdez. Do you see, this is a ship getting loaded, the ship getting loaded. This is the tank farm and the pipeline comes in over these mountains. Um, who do you trust? Ultimately, it was local villagers who knew some of the best information about the currents that the government didn't know. Uh, the wind was understood by the local people and the fishermen. Uh, it turns out that in the systemic changes that, that we're talking about now, it's going to be important that we not think of top-down wisdom, that science should be relevant at each level of governance. And for some things, the best information is going to have to be gathered down in the grassroots. Um, 
standards may have to be set by the United Nations. But in between is the puzzle because triangles are rigid and triangles pay off for at least 1% of every society uh, in the market economies I know, but also produce evictions, homelessness, and, and the, the disease that strikes those who have the least capacity uh, to resist. All right, so, so my thought is this picture is not irrelevant to the crisis we face for COVID-19. It's not uh, irrelevant to climate, but we have to shake up the way our society actually mobilizes to address them with a plan before a crisis, but when a crisis comes, a response that's guided not by lobbies, not by <laughs> campaign finance, um, but, but by the reality on the ground and in the generations to come. Okay, is that dismal enough? Because the thing about environmentalism is there are a few wonderful things, but also so many things that government doesn't want to think about, climate being one of them, until the disaster comes upon us. All right, I think I can stop there. David, have I opened up enough? Clayton, have I opened enough? So, so I think there probably will be a question or two. How are we doing on time? I think we're doing well time-wise. I think we can go another easy 20 minutes, uh, 20, 25 minutes if people have questions and would like to engage. And David, I know that you probably have some questions. I have some questions of my own and, and people should definitely chime in on chat with their questions as well. So, but David, I would, uh, I'd be very interested in, in where your thoughts are right now and, and how you, you want to kick us off? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, uh, I, I was sort of intrigued uh, by uh, your talk of uh, the Obama administration's collapse on climate change. What could could you talk in a little more detail about what that consisted of and uh, how he was, uh, you know, how that comports with uh, some of the um, strong or relatively strong uh, executive actions that he took, including, as, as you pointed out, the Clean Power Plan and also the agreement he reached uh, with the uh, auto companies on uh, mileage standards, uh, which were pretty ambitious. Yeah, yeah. it turns out that airport is very publicly manageable. Remember the Clean Air Act started with the disaster that grandmothers were falling over dead in Donora, Pennsylvania, and it was covered as, oh my God, what we're breathing. Um, it, it turns out that uh, fossil fuels were identified by John Holdren, who was Obama's science advisor, as a disaster in the making. And Obama realized that. And every step he took, he thought he was going to have the Congress with him for the second two years of his administration. But the fossil fuel industry was spectacular. The Koch brothers, uh, you know, oil people, uh, and, and the Heritage Foundation and Federalist Society, they worked really hard to win the Senate. Uh, and, and it turns out that that's what killed the Obama administration. It turns out that DACA came early and DACA was not something that the market hated. Um, air pollution, eh, that was possible. Um, the clean power plan, uh, Automobiles, it turns out that automobile manufacturers were not at all worried because they had technology that they knew customers would pay for um, and, and uh, they wanted certainty. And Obama gave them certainty. <laughs> the emission standards recently rolled back. But yeah, this one was the big one. Fossil fuels are, I mean, the, the lobbyists, there are thousands of them in Washington working for this one industry. 
and, and that, that counts all the lawyers and, and the PR and, and what have you. Um, oh, Carter was a babe in the woods. Uh, I, I was working in Washington when Carter was, he was a wonderful guy. He once called me when, in the biggest case I ever had, when he just signed a bill overriding his own policies and my Supreme Court verdict. And he said, I'm sorry, but the, the political forces were insisting on it. I mean, he was the president of the United States. Obama, however, was a politician. But reading, number one, he was unfortunately a black politician. And it seems to me, David, that's part of the answer to your question. That's glum. I wonder, go ahead, David. No, go ahead. So I'm just wondering, I, I was talking to somebody earlier today and they were talking about this time that we're going through and drawing an analogy between the challenges that, that Americans faced when we were like living through World War II. Uh, we have mounting casualties. Uh, we've got you know some, some people out there in the world that are not making wise decisions to put it very like, uh, it's, it's probably being very way overly kind uh, to the actions that people are taking. But in World War II, there were models where people were able to practice self-sacrifice um, and support some programs that um, brought some pretty incredible change. And if you look at, I mean, there was a lot of industries that came together there's a lot of potential. You you mentioned in one slide, Obama was looking at his clean power plan and how that was going to bring a lot of jobs. Um, we have a lot of people that are out of work these days. Um, I think, you know, what, what, do you see opportunities? I, I know it's it's very easy to get frustrated by how people haven't been able to to heed the call and to look at the reports and say, you know, there's this, there's this, there's all these things that people should be doing and they haven't done them. Do you see any reason today why things can be different? Why there are, do you see space for hope where, you know, we have such a global problem in COVID that is like the global problem that we had with fascism, um, you know, 75 years ago, um, that perhaps there's an opportunity, perhaps we're actually seeing people rallying in, in any ways. And, and I know we're not looking at specific examples of rallying, but I can think of you know, when we think about climate change and I think about like some of Bill McKibben's work and uh, looking at, you know, watching how forests have come back. Um, I don't know if you've been back to Alaska since uh, visiting and, and seeing these spills. Have we seen, uh, do we have any natural examples of resilience and just systems that have come back and recovered? You know, okay. Tell, I don't know. Tell me, Let's, friends, you were listening. How many questions did Clayton just ask me? Uh, I think it was 13, uh, but you also led us into the answers as well. I mean, there are a bunch of different ways to take it. 1980, the United States started shifting from a communitarian president to an individualism uber alles president. And I could see it in the students. Uh, uh, I could see it in, in the politics uh, of the United States. We became far more individualistic but we do respond to a crisis where there are casualties immediately. And so COVID-19, there are casualties. And in, in the war, there were casualties, but you know, the point was that there would be greater casualties if Hitler was able to take over Europe. There would be greater casualties if we didn't respond to COVID-19. And so the states responded in, all of them had to respond in some way because it was so visible. And the tragedy of climate is that it makes you sweat, but it's not visible unless you go look at the glaciers that used to be there, unless you watch uh, Iceland melting. But so, so what I'm saying is human nature responds to a crisis that is imminent uh, and visible, tangible. And the climate is suddenly more, starting with Superstorm Sandy, right? Um, and, and so I think that Obama 
if he'd been able to have a, a bipartisan Congress could have moved us toward the kind of economy that Europe is moving toward, uh, where, where coal is increasingly uh, not the, the basis of the energy systems uh, and planning is, is what governs. It turns out that planning in the United States is anathema. It's communism, just like the Russians. Oh no, we love the Russians now. So, so we are at a fulcrum in history and there's some really good things going. That is to say, the disaster of COVID-19 is visible and it is coming right at us. And we know that it's gonna go right up, up, up unless we do something about it. It doesn't miraculously disappear. Uh, and climate is at last visible. And I, I, I know that if Mr. Biden have been a little bit in touch with the campaign, there will be a very active attempt to catch up with the Paris Agreement, but we have to do much more. Carbon fees, uh, uh, it seems to me, is the way to go. The Republicans who uh, are against Trump are for carbon fees. So, you know, but the more you asked your question, Clayton, the more all of us listening to you were recognizing this really is a human problem that politics reflects the human dynamics which, I mean, I think most Americans ultimately are communitarian as well as individualistic. And the more they can identify with people dying or houses and forests, fires, and you, you name it, the more the politicians who are just there to maintain their jobs uh, will do what they have to do to maintain their jobs. When I was in Washington, there were only six members of Congress who always voted on the public merits and three of them were ministers. Uh, the rest of the 535 were voting with, with the triangles in mind, sometimes avoiding the triangles, sometimes being dominated. But do you see why that image to me was such an eye-opening image of how government really works. And then that dipolar system, which really, you know, gets blocked, uh, shifting to pluralism. Well, Obama was the wrong person, I guess, uh, because Mitch McConnell clearly didn't want a black person with two terms. But we in the United States, I think, have a lot of bright people and even more caring people than bright people. So the more visible it becomes, I think the better off those systemic changes. But changes do you see are necessary uh, economically as well as ecologically. Uh, and, and obviously science, knowledge has to lead the way. It can't be a game show, uh, a fake game show that, that actually produces our national agenda. We know who the winners of the game show we're gonna be and it's never the contestants, it's always the advertisers, so. Um, yep. I have a couple, of, so we have Ron Dudkoff, who is, uh, David mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, a friend of the Quincy Climate Action Network and a friend of David's, uh, is going to be doing a program. We're still working on the title, but a teaser for folks. Uh, and, and Zig, I think you may be in, interested in joining us too. It's all about, I, I, one of the, the titles we're throwing around is Climate Change for Dummies, What Can You Do? So we're definitely gonna have some more time to, to engage with this question. We had somebody uh, in one of the chats um, had, who wanted to share something that I wanna share with you, with you and kind of get your reaction which was that um, uh, he feels that the problem with climate change resistance is immediate gratification. 
It's always been rewarding in the short term to not fight climate change. Uh, Al Gore was rightly calling the prospect of fighting climate change. It, it's an inconvenience, you know, oh, I have to be hot. Oh, it's gonna take me longer to get somewhere than I can in this jet or whatever it is. Um, so they're asking what short-term carrots can we promise to armchair moms and dads who are out there working to fight climate change so that there's some kind of, you know, are there opportunities for immediate gratification instead of having to wait for the impact for two to three generations from now? Um, I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. John, uh, my, by the way, I have a sign here. Steve Mann is requesting remote control of your screen. What's that? I'm sorry, Steve, we're not gonna be able to share control of the screen. So you can ask me questions, Steve, on the, uh, the chat channel, but we're not gonna see control. So my, my thought is that Obama was right, that if you change your energy system, so it's focusing on efficiency, which takes a lot of science and a lot of technicians, uh, on alternative sources of power. Uh, again, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania where the coal mines were using fewer and fewer people, like the, the Exxon Valdez, like the Alyeska uh, single hull sh ships. Um, so, so employment, it seems to me, is, is a way of saying, uh, let's lobby for what Obama was trying to, to give us. Let's try to, to uh, support companies that, that are moving toward efficiency and, and alter. I mean, obviously it has to be at a variety of different levels, but the consumer level, the consumer of goods and the consumer of politics, uh, both you know, are, are voting with their dollar and, and, and that, that can be powerful indeed. Um, visibility of crises and, and, you know, commiserating with those you see who are being so hurt because you think, well, there but for the grace of God go I. That gets attention. And you're right, climate is way behind COVID-19 in the immediacy, the visibility, and the shock value. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, and George Floyd, I think, will never be forgotten. Eric Garner was forgotten. But, but so, so just think of all of the crises, the systemic changes we're facing. I don't think America is digging its head into the sand. Uh, and if it does, we're, we're, we're cooked. Literally. Yeah, I saw an interesting uh, study just earlier today. It was I don't remember the original source. It was cited in PubMed, um, but it was that it was a study of in hospitals. Uh, and stay with me for a moment. It was a study uh, that I, I, some hospital systems did with a couple different signs, um, and the signs were to encourage people to wash their hands. And there was only one word that was different between the signs. One sign said, "Washing hands uh, will protect you know your health." And the other sign said, washing hands will protect patients' health. Which do you think was more effective in getting people to wash their hands? And to wear masks. So, it's well, obviously, it's all related. So what was encouraging was that the people, there was 45% more soap used next to the signs that said, washing hands will protect patients' lives. So, really? So it's similar to mask use. I think if we tell people wear masks to protect yourself, we have always been taught that we are very self-interested creatures and we, we will do things for ourselves, but we also think that we're invincible. And we see all these people that are going and thinking, well, I can deal with the heat or with this. But maybe if we tell people, you know, where the, the, one of the suggestions from this was, you know, if we tell people to do something because we care about, you know, we care about our seniors, to our you know uh, you know compromise we don't want to get them sick we care about maybe we can't talk about two or three generations because that's too far away but maybe we can talk about people who have cancer 
uh, and we need to be washing our hands so we don't make people with cancer, you know, make their lives any worse. Um, you know, we can paint pictures of, you know, people that we can all know. So we're not thinking invincible us, but, you know, try to, to trigger this, um, th this feeling of empathy for people that we may all know. Let uh, me give you an example. Be an effective motivator. Uh, on the masks, you can hear people saying, live free or die, right? And then you come back and say, well, live free and kill. Uh, and what, what? I mean, yeah, it's if you live free without a mask, you could be killing people you know and love uh, or people you don't know. But that, that, when I said, I think there's a communitarian strain, strain in Americans, many of them don't realize that the mask issue that their president has told them was foolish is actually a protection of people they love and people they don't know, but could kill. Live free and kill should be on, on the, the, the posters anyway. Uh, but yeah, I make- Shifting from discussion of rights to responsibilities. Yes, it's maybe my right to live, but it's not my right. You know, we have a responsibility to care for each other and not a right to kill each other. Yeah. Amen. No so another no person. I'm sorry, David. Yeah. If no one else has uh, has uh, questions for Sig, I wanted to pose one more. Okay, we have one other question. Oh, but, okay. Um, sorry. No. No, no, it's quite fine. Um, so there's an observation that capital markets are starting to divest in oil and gas. And that's that's one of the things I was going to bring up. Yeah. Uh, let, I have a story. Yeah, there's a movement away from fossil fuels. I was coming down the steps of the uh, Alaska Capitol late one night. Uh, that's the, they have meetings late into the night. And this woman said to me, you know, they are putting a gold mine and they're using a virgin wilderness creek as their disposal lagoon. And uh, I said, well, have you talked about it with the government? Well, of course, yes, but, but a gold mine? What can we do? What I said, are you guys thinking of litigation? She said, well, yeah. I said, why don't you contact the securities analysts in New York and say, this is what they are doing. It is clearly illegal. And the investment you make in this particular company will be blown apart when the lagoon dumping is, a, is revealed, of course, as being a violation of the Clean Water Act. And so do you see what I'm talking about? Capital markets respond to information. And a number of securities analysts said, we would never have known this, but for your citizen letters. A couple of securities analysts said, how dare you defame this important Fortune 500 company. But my, po my point is your point, that, that we can use information <clears throat> with the market because the market ultimately, uh, it has to deal with reality. It's learning that now uh, in a way that I think, as you suggest, is, is going to be part of the systemic change. There have been a couple of other uh, setbacks from the fossil fuel industry recently, we've seen some pipeline projects canceled and uh, the, uh, uh, in some cases because of court decisions um, and, uh, and we're seeing uh, the use of coal in the United States uh, either flat or dropping uh, despite Donald Trump's efforts to uh, revive the industry. Um, uh, can we take uh, comfort in, in, in those things or are they just, uh, kind of lips and uh, if, uh, or, or might they represent the trend? And if so, uh, why would think, you know, why uh, given all the strength of the iron triangles and the, uh, uh, the uh, intentions of the Trump administration, uh, would, uh, would uh, those things be happening uh, nevertheless? Well, let me pull Clayton's point into this one. The Atlantic Coast uh, uh, pipeline uh, was, was ended two weeks ago 
because the financiers, financiers for the project said, you know, we don't think it's any longer viable given the volatility of the market uh, and the fact that enough politicians are being pushed by enough citizens uh, as if they are in Weymouth now, uh, that, that mm, let's see if there's a better way to invest our, our any energy dollars. Um, and the Dakota pipeline, by the way, the lead attorney sitting there with the, the Sioux Lakota chief, Jan Hasselman is, is a Boston College Law graduate, cool. uh, my research assistant who has been on TV and is going to be going through hell in the next two months. But the, the point being, Americans are looking at not just people who look just like them. In the ACC pipeline case, the media noticed that there were two African-American communities that were gonna be hammered by that particular project. And the companies, the financiers realized that there was going to be embarrassing as well as potentially losing litigation. Uh, and, and with the <clears throat> Dakota pipeline, you know, Indians, have a heartbeat that they share with many Americans who came many, many years after the, by the way, I, I, I worked for the Cherokee and they said, call us Indians. Native Americans, that's what they say in New York. Um, uh, but, but my point being that I, I think that part of the genius of the generation to come is the ability to transmit accurate information uh, in a storm of inaccurate information. We're still getting that one clear, but just imagine if indeed the bad things that might come or the bad things that are happening can be visible in a way that people will uh, commiserate with, will identify with, that, that changes things immediately because you know people vote, where there are votes and with dictators, there are people that have coups. So, so, so we're, we're talking about a system in flux and we're being pushed by disasters, but the way we started, I think, is probably the way we end. That, that disasters that are well perceived and well described and well understood are, are probably the best way to advance in every area of societal uh, endeavor. I just wish that so many people wouldn't die. Um, but we are making progress as a planet. It seems to me we're not going backwards. I'm, I'm glad to, to hear you conclude on a, that's more upbeat than we've been for a lot of the night. So there's been some other observations of uh, folks looking and, and, and it's easy looking at all the evidence um, to be confused or just downright frustrated. There's been uh, some comments looking at, you know, looking at the impact of COVID on the oil industry. And we're seeing, you know, gas prices at these crazy lows and glut of offshore uh, oil that is, and, and, and just the, the oil supply seems incredible. So if we can return to that and, and, and learn, there was a, a speech uh, given by Naomi Klein that I, I caught in a couple of different places back. I think I first saw it in March um, where she was talking about some of the lessons that she learned uh, researching and writing her book on disaster capitalism, uh, which was just ringing with me as you were speaking, Zig. Um, yeah, that's and how it's exactly yeah. true. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, I mean, and we've seen it used in a lot of different ways. We've certainly seen private industries come in and take advantage of disasters to, um, publicize expenses and privatize wealth uh, and, and just to do movement in that fashion. So I, I appreciate your efforts tonight to, to shed some more light on, on the players and who is, uh, who's been benefiting, who's been paying the cost all these years. One more uh, some, book, Rebecca Henderson. Rebecca Henderson has written a book on the new capitalism, which is really brilliant. Uh, and capitalism obviously has to be part. It's a system that works better than government in certain ways. 
Uh, but the iron triangles, it seems to me, are in the crosshairs. And, and that's good. It is good. Well, David, any final thoughts? I think we are reaching the end of our program. I think we've reached the end of our program. I'm delighted to meet you people visually. Um, and thank you, David, and thank you, Clayton, for making this happen. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. <laughs> and Martha, thank you for sitting in. Of course, thank you. We've had uh, people participating uh, on across Zoom and Facebook. So I want to say thank you to the folks that have been there as well. Um, it seems like we've had, it hasn't been great large crowds in any of these channels, but we will be, we have been recording this. We will be making this recording available. So anybody who would like to share those with friends, family members, anyone, it, as you were saying, you know, it's, it's about information. It's about communication. Um, so we definitely want to do our part to make this information and knowledge available as wide as we can. So can you let us know how to find it? After this. Can you let the us easiest know? Way, um, yeah, to, to find the video, if you can just go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Thomas Crane Public Library. Um, I'll be glad to give you a direct link to the video. I'll send that um, here. I, I can do that when we're off. We'll actually do a little pre uh, post-production work. Um, which just tightens up, basically cuts out my long introduction and, uh, and just makes it a, a nice package. Um, that takes a little bit of time. The QATV will do that for us. Um, we'll be airing this on QATV. So people are watching Channel 8 and Quincy can see this come around on the, the regular rotation. Um, so we'll be sharing this with as many people as we can share it with. You know, I talked a lot without, uh, I really would like the idea next time we do this, to stop at several places and, and bring people in asking questions and getting at me asking questions of them as well as them asking questions. Because guys, I, I tried not to bore you, but I was starting to bore myself just on and on and on. It was nice to end with a little bit of optimism. But also the dipolar, multicentric, I think that, and iron triangles, do you see how that opens up your understanding of what happens and what has to change. Definitely helps focus the, uh, the action where we gotta go. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure right, talking you. to Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, thank you. Take Good care. night. Cheers.